aftermath of September 11, 2001, Americans realized that the nature of warfare had changed forever. Our enemies were no longer nations whose might and power are measured by the size of their military, but now we face a greater threat, one posed by a handful of individuals who may even lie within the borders of our own country. But here's an interesting thought. What is now true of our nation has always been true for the church. Warfare against Christians has never been by conventional means. Paul makes it clear in Ephesians that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but our enemies are spiritual in nature. So while the tactics of our national defense continue to change and improve, the tactics of Christians remain timeless and true. And that's what we're talking about on this broadcast of the Sunday Sermon with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. In just a few minutes... We'll make our way to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 for our message titled, The Secret Weapon of Spiritual Warfare. But first, let's share a few letters that we've recently received from our fellow passengers on the Bible bus. Here's one from a listener of our Croatian broadcast. I can't begin to describe the great joy I feel since you began airing in my city. I am not well and am unable to go to church. Thank you for your programs that feed my soul. You've helped me understand so much in your programs. The Bible is much clearer to me now. I praise the Lord for your teacher who is clearly anointed. I pray for those who are working hard to make each broadcast possible. May our God bless you abundantly. And then next we've got an email from Ivan, a listener of our Bulgarian language broadcast. My family listens to your teaching on the Internet every day. We live in a small village and have no church. Your messages make us feel connected to not only God, but other Christians too. Thank you for the continued encouragement. And then we've got Luisa in Albania who wrote this. A few years ago, I found out my husband had another family. I divorced him, and my nine-year-old son and I are now rebuilding our lives. Your programs have been a good friend to me during this time. I have felt very lonely, and through your teaching I have learned that God is with me no matter how difficult my life is. May you be blessed for the kindness that you have shown me every day. And then this last email comes from a listener of our Romanian broadcasts. I first found your teaching while living in Italy. I was so inspired by God's word that when I moved home to Romania, I built a church building on my property and I invited the village to join me. We don't have a regular pastor, so we play your programs and discuss them. I also like your app. Jobs are rare in my area, so I often travel outside the country for business. Listening to your programs on my cell phone helps me stay connected when I'm away. Thank you for all you do. Well, why don't you join us in praying for these brothers and sisters in Christ and the millions of others as our world prayer team travels on our knees through Central Europe this week. If you want more information and to sign up to receive our daily prayer prompts, then visit us at ttb.org forward slash pray. And let's do that now. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and your spirit that give us the assurance of how to face the battles that come our way. Open our hearts and our minds as we study today and help us to hear directly from you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Our subject today is the secret weapons of spiritual warfare. Veiled and guarded statements are released from time to time by our Defense Department as to the potential and capability of our country in any future wars. A dark and foreboding picture is painted by some of the scientists today who are in the know that the United States and Russia today have an arsenal that is capable of exterminating human life on this planet and of reducing the land surface to a vast wasteland. Such statements, of course, are frightening and they're alarming. And they're certainly not conducive to producing a peace of mind. And then the contemplation of the future with even more deadly and lethal weapons does not contribute to the well-being of the human race today. 
This all-out attention that is given to the ominous approach of World War III has caused many believers today to lose sight of the warfare in which they are presently engaged and actively engaged, if you please. Therefore, they have become unacquainted with the weapons that are available and the technique for their effective use. This morning we are turning to that subject because every believer here today and listening in is engaged in a spiritual struggle, whether we wish it or not. No United Nations can prevent it or no treaty of peace could make it otherwise. And this morning I would like to think along these three lines first. The warfare is spiritual. Second, the weapons are secret. And third, the warriors are successful. Now will you notice, first here at verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Chapter 10 here of 2 Corinthians actually marks a radical change in the tone and the style of this epistle. So much so that many of the higher critics today have supposed that chapter 10 is really the beginning of the third epistle of Paul to the Corinthians and that it was put together with the second epistle and they both have been made one. May I say that that's mere conjecture, and I think the change in tone, which is certainly a sharp contrast, can be explained easily on another basis altogether. To begin with, the church in Corinth was divided. When Paul wrote his first epistle, the very first thing he addressed himself to them was, he says that there not be any divisions among you. And Paul wouldn't have said that if there hadn't been divisions among them, and he immediately goes into that. And the interesting thing is the church in Corinth was divided. The majority in the church were for Paul the apostle, and they respected his authority. The minority in the church, they were opposed to the Apostle Paul, and they rejected his authority. The majority were loyal to this Apostle. The minority were disloyal and criticized him extensively. Therefore, what you have in this second epistle is this. In the first nine chapters, Paul is addressing himself to the majority. And his theme is comfort. You'll find that the undertone and the overtone of this particular section. But in this last section here, beginning with chapter 10, you have the minority report. And believe me, there is a chain. He's now addressing a disloyal minority group. And it's like changing from day to night, from light to darkness, from hot to cold. It is a radical change. Now the minority were criticizing him severely. You see, he had written a very strong letter of correction, even threatening them. And those of you that have been with us on Thursday night as we studied 1 Corinthians know that Paul went into practically every area of the Christian life went into those things that are temporalities, those things that are spiritualities. He went into everything from, well, from women's dress to speaking in tongues. He covered it all. He had something very strong to say about all of it, if you please. This was a very strong letter. The minority did not like it, of course, because they do not care, never care, for that kind of ministry or that kind of preaching. And therefore, they were now saying this in criticism of him. They says, Paul writes big, but he's really little. We remember when he was here among us. Very insignificant type fellow, this fellow Paul. He sure is writing as if he's somebody. 
I do not know, but I judge that the personal appearance of Paul was not impressive. I'm not taking time this morning to go into that, but right in this very chapter, in verse 10, he says, listen to him, for, that, this is what they were saying, for his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. That is, his speech, well, he's no great orator, and yet I think Paul was a great orator, but that's what they were saying about him. Now Paul faces this unscrupulous minority who were the opponents not only of Paul, but really of the gospel and the word of God itself. And he opposes them and, uh, and speaks out to them without any preliminary or circumlocution at all. Listen to him. Now I, Paul, myself... And that's using the first personal pronoun three times. I, Paul, myself, refers to himself three times. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. Now, when he came to Corinth the first time, he came as our Lord came to this earth. And may I say this, because I'm of the opinion that a great many people have a notion that our Lord stood out in any crowd. I don't think so. Our Lord was not in personal appearance as striking and different as the artists today would have you believe. If you think he looked like Solomon's head of Christ, I think you're wrong. Our Lord said, I am meek and lowly. And when he walked this earth, even the people where he was brought up, they had to say, is, isn't he the carpenter's son? He had no halo around him. He was human, perfectly human, if you please. And he walked this earth, meek and lowly. And my beloved, that's still the badge of his followers. And the fraternity pin of believers is still this, meek and lowly. Now, Paul says, don't let looks fool you. When I came among you, I came like my Lord came. You notice what he says? I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That's the way I came. But don't let looks fool, fool you, because Paul had something, unfortunately, we do not have today, and we are not to have it, I'm sure. He had the authority of an apostle. You and I this morning cannot conceive of what that authority was, and that will explain why so many of the things Paul did that his ministers do not do today. He had miracle gifts. Believe me, friends, he could exercise them. We saw the other night that these miracle gifts were gifts that uh, set him apart. They were his badge that he was an apostle. And he had a divine mission. Christ had called him to be a missionary to the Gentiles. And when Paul spoke, he spoke with authority. I say this, no man has a right to stand in the pulpit today that cannot speak from God's word with authority. The minute he loses that, he should step out of the pulpit. The best criticism I've heard of this preacher was said last Sunday night when I spoke on that controversial subject. Somebody says, trouble with McGee is he's too dogmatic. I'm glad you got the point. That was exactly what it was. As dogmatic as the Word of God is dogmatic, my beloved, and I propose not to be any more dogmatic than that. Paul was conscious of a supernatural power, and Paul exercised that power, my beloved. I have here a statement, and it's so rich. I want to share it with you today. And it comes from a great man. Dr. Charles Hodge, 
He's a theologian of which there is no witcher. He was, he was in Princeton Seminary back in the long ago, in the dark ages when Princeton was in the light. Will you listen to his statement? It is terrific. Paul told the Corinthians in his former epistle that he did not appear among them as a philosopher, but as a witness. He came not with the words of man's wisdom. He did not rely for success on his powers of argument or of persuasion, but on the demonstration of the Spirit. The faith which he labored to secure was not to be founded on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. Not on arguments addressed to the understanding, but on the testimony of God. That testimony has the same effect which intuition has. It reveals the truth to the mind and conscience as self-evident, and therefore it cannot be resisted. A rationalistic Christian, a philosophizing theologian, therefore lays aside the divine for the human, the wisdom of God for the wisdom of man, the infinite and infallible for the finite and fallible, the success of the gospel depends on its being presented not as the word of man, but as the word of God. Not as something to be proved, but as something to be believed. It was on this principle Paul acted, and hence he was in no degree intimidated by the number, the authority, the ability, or the learning of his opponents. He was confident that he could cast down all their proud imaginations because he relieved not on himself, but on God whose messenger he was. My beloved, that is terrific. Now will you listen to him? But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, will you listen to him? Paul urges them not to force him to exercise his authority. He says now to the minority, he says, I want you to become obedient to the Word of God. I want you no longer to cause divisions in the church. He says, because when I come to you, I'd like to come as I came the first time. I would like to come meek and lowly. But he insists that the minority not judge according to outward appearance. Paul says to them, and he makes it very clear, I don't want you to think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Paul makes it very clear that he was not walking in the strength of human wisdom, or human ability, or human strength at all, or power. Will you listen to him? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And actually, you have a play upon words here. And Paul was gifted at playing upon words. Uh, he uh, plays upon the word here, flesh. It is the Greek word sarx. And actually, it can be used in one of three ways. It can mean the body, just this body of flesh. Paul used it that way on occasion. He said to the Philippians, it is better for him, he said, to stay uh, here in the body for their sake. But he'd like to leave this body and go be with the Lord. It, it refers to the body in some places. That's the physical. It can also refer to the weakness of the body. And you will find that Paul speaks of the weakness of the body. That's a psychological factor. And then Paul more often used it in its third meaning. That is this corrupt nature that you and I have, this fallen nature, this Adamic nature. And in that sense, he uses it in the theological and spiritual sense. Now, Paul used the word in three senses, but I believe that here he's using it in the last two senses. And I mean this. He's playing upon it. Do you notice? He says, we walk in the flesh. He says, I'm after all, I'm in this body. 
and I'm subject to the weakness of this body. I'm walking in the flesh, but I do not war according to the flesh. I do not war according to this old nature that I've got. A lot of Christian work today is done in the power of that old nature. Listen to Paul as he talks about this old Adamic nature. I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Have you found that to be true? Paul could say in the 8th chapter of Romans, the 8th verse, So then, they that are in the flesh, in this old Adamic nature, they cannot please God. Now, Paul uses it here, I think, primarily in that sense. He says, I am not coming to Corinth in the energy of the flesh. Because, he says, the warfare that we're engaged in today is a spiritual warfare. You remember he said to the Ephesians later on, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers. Our warfare is a spiritual warfare, and this old Adamic nature cannot cannot, unable, not only it cannot please God, it cannot compete and meet this spiritual enemy at all. So, when he came to Corinth, and I hope that I can make this clear to you this morning, he did not come as an ordinary man, depending upon the principles of the natural, acting under the flesh. He did not come into the city of Corinth with a Madison Avenue campaign. He did not use methods when he came. He didn't say, now this method is better than another method. He did not have an advertising campaign that preceded his coming into the city. He did not have an organization. He did not come in human effort and human energy. He wasn't one of the personality boys that uh, gets by because he has a very pleasing personality and he's very clever and he knows crowd psychology. Paul didn't come on that basis to Corinth. And he didn't come using a few little Christian cliches and beautiful language and philosophical arguments, and he did not come on an anti-something campaign. He didn't come to Corinth with an anti-Nero campaign. And by the way, that would have been a good one. But Paul never led in an anti-Nero campaign or an anti-Caesar campaign. And old Gallio wouldn't hear his case, and we're going to see Gallio did right when we give our illustrated message on Corinth. And he didn't say Gallio is a communist either. And he did not come to Corinth to clean up the city. And if there ever was a place that needed cleaning up, one was Corinth and the other's Los Angeles. Corinth was so degraded and depraved in the Roman Empire that they had coined a Greek word, Corinthicized. And to Corinthicize was to engage in bacchanaling orgies to the very limit, and licentious living was reduced to the lowest level. That was Corinth. And my beloved, will you hear me? He did not come to Corinth at the invitation of the fundamentalists. Oh, this business today are depending on the weak arm of the flesh. When he came to Corinth, came to Corinth in the power of the Holy Spirit, not depending upon the flesh at all or this old nature. Will you listen to him? I go back to his first epistle. These are things I did not deal with at that time. I wanted to deal with them this morning. Listen to him in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter at the very beginning. Listen to this man. And I, brethren... When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. 
And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. What a picture. Paul had a grand perspective, if you please, of the entire battlefield. He saw there was a heaven to gain, there was a hell to shun, and that there were multitudes of people in the city of Corinth who were lost and needed the gospel, and it could only come to them, not through the ability of Paul, but through the power, the demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. So that this man, Paul the Apostle, saw that the warfare is spiritual. We come to the second, the weapons are secret. Will you listen to this? And I think probably I should uh, turn back again to this version, since it gives us a correct, I think, rendering, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty before God to the casting down of strongholds. The weapons are secret. In fact, they're so secret that Paul doesn't even list them here. And you will find that even in this translation, this verse is made a parenthesis. And it's in my translation a parenthesis. And the Greek text makes it that way. And when you have all of them against you, it's very difficult to disagree. But I disagree. And I was delighted because I had to go back and do a little research. And I found out, found out some of you outstanding German scholars say that this is the main verse. That's what I say. It's not in parenthesis, and it should not be in parenthesis. This is the high point. Weapons are secret. Now, are we able to identify them? Well, he says that spiritual warfare with a spiritual enemy requires spiritual weapons. He says our weapons are not of the flesh. He lets us in on that. And then he tells us that they are mighty. That is, they're effective, he says. These weapons are effective. So we want to see what they are. He says what they'll do... He gives the negative thing that they'll do and the positive side of it also. They're both destructive and constructive. Listen to him. He says here, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. That's the negative side. That's the destructive side. Casting down imaginations. The word imagination means reasoning. We get our word logic from that same Greek word. It means vain philosophy. It means the sophistry of the Greeks. And if you're acquainted with Greek philosophy, you know it during the time of Plato and Socrates, philosophy went to such a high plane that men since then have never been able to quite come back to it. And when they come back, they always come back to it. But after that, it degraded and descended into a, nothing in the world but Pershing Square arguing. And Paul would not engage in that. He was too intellectual, if you want to know the truth. That's the reason he would not get embroiled in that kind of a thing at all. And Paul made it very clear that he says, the gospel that I preach is a gospel that will destroy these arguments of man. No man was ever won by whipping him down intellectually. And then he says, it not only will do that, but it will cast down every high thing. Yonder in the city of Corinth on what was known as the acro Corinthus, about 2,000 feet above the city, was probably the most debased religion the world's ever seen. It will compare to the worship of Bacchus, the worship of Baal, or any of these base religions. It was the worship of Aphrodite, and there was a temple to Aphrodite. In that temple, there were 1,000 priestess who were nothing more nor less than simple prostitutes. And religion was sex as far as the Corinthians were concerned. Paul never preached against it. But when Paul came into the city of Corinth, he says, I have a gospel that can pull down strongholds. And for your information this morning, my beloved, it was the gospel that he preached that pulled it down. 
It was that gospel, as Gibbon says, when this little crippled Jew went hobbling into the city of Rome, he brought a gospel that brought the Roman Empire down. For Gibbon says it could not, the immoral condition of Rome could not stand up against the preaching of the Apostle Paul and those who followed him. All knew what this gospel would do, and unfortunately today we do not. The weapons are secret. What are they? He says that they're also positive. Will you notice what he says? Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And I want to say to you when I read that, it overwhelms me. Do you know what it is to have every thought you've got today brought in obedience to Jesus Christ? I say this. Only the gospel, only the contemplation of this glorious person of Jesus Christ, and only a walk with him and an obedience to him, my beloved, is going to bring us where our thought life is brought into captivity to him today. I'm afraid we don't know this kind of power, what weapons this man must have had. Let me list several of these weapons this morning, and this is not exhaustive. I'm merely being suggestive. First, may I say this, and will you listen very carefully? I'm making a distinction again. The first weapon is the Word of God. And just because he says our weapons are spiritual and not uh, of the flesh, it doesn't mean that they're not visible. Uh, we have a notion today, a thing that to be spiritual, it's uh, something you can't see or put your hands on. And if it's carnal, it's something that you can really get your hands on and something you can see. Well, the worst form of carnality is, uh, well, it's hate. You can't see it. You see the demonstration of it. And covetousness. You, you see, carnality does not have to be that which is material. And we mentioned this last Sunday, and this is important for us to get and to see. Now, the Word of God is the spiritual weapon of the believer today. And this is what I mean. I'm talking now about something more than just the inspiration of the Scriptures. I'm not talking about a creed where you join the church of the open door and you're given the doctrinal statement and it says that you must believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And you say, oh yes, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. We've got a lot of folk that believe it, but they live like atheists, live like agnostics. And may the preacher make a confession, I'm afraid there are times when we act the same way. Oh, if I can only get this over to you. I listened to a preacher riding up through the valley, the San Joaquin Valley, the other day. He said he believed in ins verbal inspiration. I wish he'd said plenary verbal inspiration. You perhaps think I'm splitting theological hairs. But after he said he believed it, then he spent his time quoting poetry, giving cute little cliches, heard epigrams and every form of philosophical argument that is imaginable, and no exposition of the Word which proved he did not believe this is the Word of God. Do you see what I mean now? Paul had a confidence in the book, in the gospel that he preached, had confidence in it. And as someone has says, his confidence was not self-confidence, but confidence in God. His self-commendation amounted to nothing unless the Lord commended him. Paul constantly felt that in himself he could do nothing, but in the Lord he could do all things. Listen to him. Right in this very same chapter, the last two verses, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Paul had confidence in the Word of God. 
He could come to Corinth, that citadel of Greek philosophy, with that base religion yonder, and he could say, I'm preaching a gospel that will bring down strongholds, and it'll bring down high places, and it did. And he used nothing but the Word of God. That's what he said. When he became an old man, he's in prison in Rome. He writes an epistle, and he says, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that's the only sword we got. And Paul drew his trusty sword, and he depended on the naked blade of that sword. And he says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I tell you, he's talking to the so-called intellectuals of that day. And Paul was an intellectual. Read Romans, and then tell me you understand it. Paul was an intellectual, and yet Paul said, I determined with you Corinthians who like to argue, you're a bunch of Pershing Square philosophers. If you think I'm engaging in argument, you know, sir, I'm here to preach the gospel. It's the only thing that can transform lives. He went into that city, and he tells us what he preached. In the 15th chapter, he says, I declared unto you the gospel. He says, that gospel is what saved you, and it's wherein you stand. He says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And Paul says, when you take those historical facts... And trust Christ, it'll transform your life. My beloved, we're in a lots better position today to believe this book than Paul was. To begin with, he had no New Testament. We have greater reason for confidence. Did you know the high critic has been through this book with a fine-tooth comb? That there is such a thing as high criticism, and there's such a thing as certain texts be, that are questionable. It's all true. But after you've said all that and gone through all of that, we today have a book and a gospel in which we can have confidence, and it's the same one that Paul had. I'm tired today hearing men say, I'm a conservative. I believe in the inspiration of the Bible, and then they demyth- uh, demythologize the creation story, and they say, I do not believe in hell. They take the beginning of the Bible out, they take the end of the Bible out, and they say then in the middle there may be some questions, but we are believe in the inspiration. My friend, you don't believe in the inspiration. You have a right for your position, but you have no right to say you believe that this is the Word of God. May I say to you, this is a book in which we need to have confidence today. And no wonder that the enemy has leveled his attack at the book. Because, well, isn't Russia trying to get us to ban the bomb? Well, the devil's been trying to get us to ban the Bible for years. And it's the only weapon we've got. Oh, I'd love to stay here. The second is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit. And I find that this man here, he, he, uh, he mentions this. Let me turn here for just a moment to, uh, to 2 Corinthians, to the first chapter, verse 22. Who hath also sealed us? And given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now Paul recognized his human weakness. And he recognized there was no power within him at all. He says here in the third chapter, verse 6, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And then in the fourth chapter, verses 4 and 5, he says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 
For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul's other weapon was the presence of the Holy Spirit. He went to Corinth in the power of the Holy Spirit with a gospel that can only be understood as the Holy Spirit will take the things of Christ and show them unto us. The third one, and I'm amazed that Paul does not talk about prayer in either one of the epistles to the Corinthians. That's not his subject. There's very little, and I think there's a reason for that. I do not think many of the Corinthians were even on praying grounds. He does mention it here on one occasion, and casually, ye also helping together by prayer for us. That's uh, 2 Corinthians 1.11. But Paul insisted that prayer was one of the weapons because in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, when he mentions the two weapons of offense, he mentions the Word of God, and then he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer is the third secret weapon. I wish I could go on, but now I want to conclude. He mentions now in closing, the warriors are successful. He doesn't say that to the minority group, but he does say it to the majority group. In 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, and will you listen to this, and we're through now. We've kept you too long. Now thanks be unto God. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. You notice what he says? He's told the majority. He didn't tell the minority this. You won't find this in chapter 10. But here in the second chapter, he says, He always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. I'm sure that there are many of us, and especially many of us preachers that say this, well, Paul, if you were a pastor in Southern California, you wouldn't be able to say that because we're in days of apostasy. We're in days when a great many people are gospel-hardened. They've heard it. They've done nothing about it. And uh, you weren't up against that. May I say to you that in case you and I think that this morning, Paul the Apostle was up against a heathenism and paganism that was definitely a satanic thing, much more than this contemporary society in which you and I find ourselves today. But that's not what he means. Will you notice what he says? For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. And my sinner friend here this morning... Do you know you can't go out of this place and walk into the presence of God and say you never heard Jesus Christ died for your sins and that by believing it, that we have a book in which we can have confidence and that he rose from the dead and we have historical evidence of that and that by trusting him he can save you? You can never go into God's presence and say you didn't hear it because you heard it this morning, those of you here and those listening in. You heard it today, and my job is through. I'm blowing the whistle. I'm through. But I want to tell you, you've got a tremendous responsibility, and I'd like to be helpful to you. God's Word, the Holy Spirit, and prayer. They may seem like simple weapons, but as we heard today, they're more powerful than any stronghold that we come up against. The title of today's sermon was The Secret Weapon of Spiritual Warfare, and it's available for you to listen to again or invite a friend to listen when you visit us at ttb.org forward slash Sunday Sermon. And if you'd like to study more on the subject of spiritual warfare, visit the resources section of ttb.org where you can download a free copy of Dr. McGee's e-booklet titled How to Stand Against Satan. As we go, I invite you to join us this week for Dr. McGee's five-year study through the whole Word of God. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be sure to save a seat on the Bible bus just for you. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God 
to take the whole word to the whole world.